Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. Seems a lot of traditional woodworking wisdom is being challenged of late and the Charlesworth ruler trick could quite possibly now be the back bevel chisel trick. Stay with me and I'll tell you what I think. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. So fellow YouTuber Stumpy Nubs recently broke all the rules and he put a back bevel on a chisel, on the back of a chisel, something we typically never would do. However, in his video, and it's a very good video, I suggest you take a look at it. We'll leave a link below so you can go see it. But it actually worked in a pairing operation, which is where I would have thought it wouldn't work. And he compared it to a chisel done the proper way. So check that out. See what you think. Now I'll give you some more information that you can digest. So to start this whole process, we need to explain what the Charlesworth ruler trick is. And I'm going to introduce to you, in case you don't know, who David Charlesworth is. I met David back in 2002 or three. I can't remember which. But David is an English craftsman, if you're not familiar. He used to write for a furniture and cabinet making magazine on a regular basis. He's published two or three books and several videos. And David introduced a level of precision to woodworking that I don't think had been there before. And he also brought in some, uh, I would call them very unique techniques. The ruler trick would be the one that he's most famous for. I've often said it's the smartest thing I've ever learned about sharpening. It'll cut your time by uh, one-tenth of what it normally takes, whether you're dealing with plain blades or, uh, or even chisels. So... The ruler trick, what it amounts to is this. Instead of going in and polishing the entire back of a plane blade, and if you look real closely, you can see what's left of some of these grinding scratches that came from the factory. If they're allowed to go right to the end, under a bit of magnification, you'd have a very serrated edge as a result of those little fingers of steel left over from these troughs caused by whatever grinding medium they use. Well, and I've taught this for several years, back in the uh, 19, in, in late 1990s and early 2000s, you would go in and you would have to first flatten all of this area, and then you would move through progressive steps of stones to get rid of prior scratches until you ended up with a nice polished surface. But you'd end up with a polished surface that could be that big, and you only ever used this little bit. And when David first introduced this, we were at a Lee Nelson event, uh, I didn't take to it right away. I thought, no, 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 this is not the way to do it. But it was intriguing because if you think about it, your plane blade sits in your plane like that. Nothing touches except that leading edge. So why polish up here if this is the only part that's actually going to meet, make contact with the wood? So for those reasons, it, uh, this sounds logical. So after about a month of playing around with it, I came away thinking this is the smartest thing I've ever learned. So what you would do is set a steel rule, and what you want to be consistent with is the same rule and in the same spot. So we would always keep it flush with the opposite side of the stone. I say opposite side because we're going to use this side. Then you would set your plane blade down, and you would stay within a quarter of an inch of this edge, and you would move it forward and back, and you would work through the grits until you finally got a polish on there that would be at whatever level your highest stone was. Now, each time you would sharpen the bevel, the last thing you would do was put your ruler trick or your ruler on, on your finished stone only, come over and take just a couple of seconds to remove any burr left over, and away you'd go. Well, it actually works on scraper, scrapers as well. I use it on my, uh, on my cabinet scrapers. I use it on my scraper planes. Again, all you have to do is just polish that little leading strip. But to put it on a chisel, ugh, that has always been considered a no-no. But let's pick it up. So now when we transition to chisels, this is, these are my chisels, and you can see how flat and polished the backs are. And I hope I'm not just getting overly uh, in love with just that nice look. I'm, 
I'm hoping that what I've always believed is true, that the flatter and the more polished the back is, the better the chisel is going to perform. I can take a chisel like this, and on a surface like that, with very little uh, extra effort, I can get it to start to pair, and because it's referencing off the back of the chisel, I can maintain that angle and not worry about it uh, not coming out flat. If, and this is what Stumpy in his video did, if you put a little bit of a back bevel on, on there, then theoretically when you're holding your chisel like that, your cutting edge is sitting up off of the wood. And that leaves you, and he mentioned this as well, having to raise this up to get to the point where the edge actually starts to make contact. Well, the problem is that you now don't really have a reference surface back here other than that little wee tiny back bevel, which really doesn't provide you with much. So we've got a couple of tests that we're going to go through to see just exactly how that will perform. And But before we do that, we're actually going to go in with some fairly precise equipment, and we're going to measure how much of an offset that little back bevel is going to create compared to the actual back of the chisel. In other words, how high up in this application, how high up is the cutting edge now instead of it being referencing right there on the back. Okay, no claim on being a scientist, but we've tried to set up the best we can here in the shop to do this little experiment. I'm using the table on my general jointer, and that's a general Canadian, so it should be a good reliable surface. I've got a vise holding a brand new half inch IBC chisel. We haven't done anything to the back except we put this little uh, back bevel on there. You can see the polished strip and that mark right there is where the ruler left a mark. The idea is with this board clamped on here is that we're going to move this forward and back and I've got a dial test indicator here. Each one of these notches represents one ten thousandth of an inch. I'm going to lower it until the end of that little end of that little feeler touches the back of the chisel and then we're going to bring it around back to the zero so it's under tension. And we're going to move that to my left and we're going to watch that little pin as it almost drops off the end. And we're going to see how much of a difference, a height difference there is, the back of the chisel compared to now where this back bevel is. So the first thing we're going to do is lower this down. And we'll know it touches when that dial starts to move. Okay, now I'm going to bring it right around to the zero. And like I said, this is just so that we have it under some tension. Now I'm going to move this to my left. Now I got my magnifiers on here so I can see better, but I'm going to try to stop right. I would think wish this thing moved a little bit easier. I'm not quite there. Okay, so I may end up dropping off, but right now we are we are two tenths away from one thou. No, okay, we're a thou and a half. No, two thou, and it's still on there. No, okay, we fell off at that point. So it's at least two thousandths of an inch lower than this. So now if you look right here. I've got a piece of paper, which is, measures four thousandths of an inch. And if you lay that on a flat surface and run your finger over it, you can definitely feel the difference. This piece of shim stock is only one thousandth of an inch, and you can feel that as well. So your ability to feel is actually far greater than most people might think. Okay, so let's go over back to the bench and do some tests to see if this is going to work or if there's going to be a compromise that we may or may not want to live with. Start, we tested that several more times and we determined that a thou and a half is probably the correct amount. So what we're measuring is the distance from the back of the chisel to the cutting edge, including the back bevel. I'm actually gonna set it on a piece of wood and I'll explain it a little bit differently. This is a piece of Northern white pine, nice and soft. Why soft wood? Well, because your chisel has to be sharper to cut this and it does to cut a piece of hardwood. This stuff will crush otherwise. So what we're referring to or what we're going to try to do is we're going to pair the end of this board. It's already been shot on the shooting board so it's nice and flat. One chisel, this one, is going to lay on there and that's presenting the cutting edge on the same plane as the back of the chisel. This one with the back bevel, when I set that on there, the cutting edge is above 
the plane of the back of the chisel. So I can move that along and the cutting edge is actually sitting up, in this case, a thousandth of a half, one and a half thou above the surface. So the difference is how much control do we have? So I'm gonna come in here with my freshly sharpened and normally, this is the way I normally prepare them. I'm gonna come in here, I've got the weight of my thumb up close and I don't have to do too much to get that to actually engage and start to pair off some material. And when I'm doing that, it didn't take much more other than some downward pressure right here to get that to bite. Now let's see what happens when we try this one. So if I go along, now what I have to do in order to get that to bite, I've got to start to lift the chisel up here. Now, uh, Stumpy showed his doing it as well, and he did this. My concern is you lose that control of having a reference surface. So I'm up, I'm up. Try it again. Okay, so right there I start to bite. Now I can feel that I'm sitting up off of the surface. So a little unnerving. Maybe it's something you can get used to, maybe not. I would prefer, in this circumstance, I would prefer to have my chisel done with the back kept nice and flat. All right, let's try another test. Okay, next test is going to be flushing off a dowel. So I've got a piece of cherry, drilled a half inch hole put in a maple dowel. I used a flush trim saw. You can see some glue residue on there. I used a flush trim saw to get it close. I actually put a couple pieces of masking tape so the flush trim saw wouldn't touch the cherry and that'll just leave me a little bit to remove. So I'm gonna start off using my chisel. I say my chisel. This is the one that has the back flat from front to back. So I would go in there and I would just start to find it's easier than trying to plow all the way through. Just use the tip of the chisel. Be aware of where your hand is. Just use a shearing motion. Okay, so even with a bit of a glue residue on there, see if I can get that, can't. Okay, so I run my hand over there, and I pretty much can't detect. Now, you would feel something different because that's end grain, this is long grain, but that feels nice and smooth. Now, I'm going to try to do the same thing. This is the chisel that has the back bevel. Do it the same way. I'm going to reference it here. I really can't afford to lift this up because I don't want to damage this surface. So that's where the having the flat back as your reference uh, surface really comes into play. I'll do the same technique, just using the corner. Okay, now that's sticking up. Now in fairness, let's me try from this side. Okay, I managed to grab it there. Now see what happens? I kind of expected this. So what happens is it, as soon as it engages that, it rides up because the area behind the cutting edge is, is uh, not on the same plane as the base piece, which is this piece of cherry. So I can't really get it to bite. I could, as I said, I could lift it up to get it to engage, but then I run the risk of hitting the cherry. So when I run my finger over there, and you can actually see that's material right off of the flush trim saw, but I can definitely feel that. So in this case... Use the other chisel. Okay, good idea. Let's see what we can do. We come in with this one. Okay, it feels flush. Let's try it here. Okay, all right. This one passes, this one doesn't pass. Let's do one more. Okay, my final test, and this is the one that I would base my decision off of. Cutting dovetails, we're chiseling between the pins. That surface has to be flat or slightly concave. Now I'm going to start on this side, and I don't advocate using a block to support your chisel, but to try to make this a little more controlled, I'm going to do that. Now I've got my marking gauge still set, so I'm going to use that to make sure this block is literally right on the line. OK. 
right? Now, I use a couple of clamps to hold that in place. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our monthly newsletter has subscriber-only content, discounts monthly on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. So we'll start with this one. And the idea is we're going to keep it tight against here. We're going to go halfway from this side and halfway from the other. Now, what actually happens with a chisel prepared like this is the chisel actually wants to go like that because of the pressure of the waist pushing on the bevel, causing it to dive in. That would be okay. My, what I'm worried about is this one. It's going to do the opposite. It's going to want to shear off like this because of that back bevel. But we can test it at the end to see how we did. So right over next to the pin, set that in the gauge line. Push that one. I'm going to tap this. Okay, now we'll take this off, flip it over, and set the same setup on the other side. Okay, I'm not going to bother cleaning up in the corners because that doesn't matter for what we're going to check. Just make sure that we did the same one. Okay, put this in the vise. Make sure there's no debris in there. So we're going to use the bottom of my square. I'm going to set it down. There's actually just a little set it on there. And that needs to sit flat, meaning it can only touch on the outside corners. Can't have any rocking in the middle. We come over here. And what I expected, that rocks in the middle. So let me explain the problem. I put the joint together. It's going to touch here before it touches out here or here, and you're going to have a gap. Now, even if I was doing this freehand, with this chisel, it's always going to want to slide off like this, leaving that bump. And I used to tell my students that one of the most difficult things to do is to come in here and get rid of a bump in there. Because this whole surface is slanted up, this whole surface is slanted up, and you've got to try to start with your chisel sitting right there. Just a pain you can avoid. Okay, my final thoughts. First of all, I want to give a huge shout out to David Charlesworth because it was his technique that really has brought up this whole discussion. And I'll leave a link below. Uh, you can check out David's books and his DVDs and his technique. Also his, his uh, YouTube channel. So we'll leave that below for you. And uh, I agree with Stumpy. If your chisels are run-of-the-mill chisels and you're using it for what most people would use their chisels for, it's probably fine. It certainly is a much faster way. I didn't mention this, but to go through and to get that level of precision on the back of a chisel, even a good chisel, is going to probably represent the best part of an hour. If you're building fine furniture and you're cutting dovetails, I say, no way. You cannot do this. This has to remain the standard. Otherwise, you're going to deal with that bump in the middle, and it is not worth the aggravation. And, of course, this test was another one that's, if you really want this kind of performance from it, then you have to stay with the original thought, keeping the back of your chisel perfectly flat. 
and that's all I have to say about it. Check out Stumpy's video if you haven't. Like I said, we leave a link down below. It's well worth it. I think he's a highly qualified opinion. And as I said, I agree to a point where if your chisels are being used for uh, general run-of-the-mill stuff, by all means. Otherwise, if fine furniture, stick with the, stick with the old tried and true. Hope this helps. If you like my work and enjoy my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos and help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the link below, the chisel and plane icon, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our online and in-person workshops.